Welcome everyone. We will let a few folks make their way in from the waiting room and get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. I am so happy that you all have power and are able to join us today. I heard from a few folks this morning that they are not so lucky and are going to look forward to catching this uh, program on YouTube. So welcome to all of you who are joining that way as well. Today's Lunch and Learn is harnessing the power of human interaction to fight climate change. Oof, and we know we need to do this. To reach our emission targets, the United States needs to dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade. We have passed some of the most significant climate legislation in history in the last few years, looking at you, Inflation Reduction Act, but we have more work to do if we are going to prevent the worst climate impacts. So how do we build and rally diverse political support to pass and implement these essential climate policies? Well, there is a whole host of research that shows that peer-to-peer -peer interaction is a really strong predictor of individual beliefs and a driver of behavior change. If that sounds fascinating, but a little, you're not quite sure what that means, you're in luck because we have with us today, Casey Elizabeth Gilbert. Casey is an independent researcher affiliated with Harvard's Berkman Klein Center. She's been doing some hands-on research right here in Portland, Maine. And she is gonna share with us today how we might harness the power of social interaction to build political will and fight climate change. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to building a just, thriving future for all by acting on the climate crisis, protecting the environment, and safeguarding our democracy. MCA does that by bringing people and organizations together to educate, inspire, and advocate, and MCV by advocating for equitable policies, holding elected officials accountable, and winning elections. Since 2020, this weekly online Lunch and Learn series has helped us advance all of those goals creating a shared space to explore our environmental and social history, our policy priorities, our climate action movement, and more. A few notes before we hand things over to Casey. You will hear the presentation first, and then we'll tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You can send questions directly to me or to Maggie Summers through the chat whenever they occur to you. We'll synthesize them and ask as many of them as possible following the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties today, Maggie is your best bet. So send a message to her through the chat and she will help you out. This event is being recorded and we will post the video on our website and our YouTube later this afternoon. You'll find recordings of all of our previous programs there as well. And we have a bunch of different playlists that can help you focus in on particular topics. Thank you all again for joining us. And Casey, I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. So we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Give me just a second to share my screen. Alrighty, can you guys see this? Not quite yet. 
Oh, yes. You do now? Wonderful. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, my name is Casey, and I am a software engineer and a designer. Uh, for my day job, I'm also a climate advocate and an officer in the Army Reserves. Um, and this year, I'm an affiliate with the Berkman Klein Center out of Harvard Law School, and I've been working on some independent research um, that I'm excited to share with you guys today. So I want to just thank you all for being here. Um, it's a privilege to be able to, um, to share this, and I'm, I'm really excited. So today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we can use technology and data to measure social interactions in order to build political will to fight climate change. So here's a quick preview about what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna start off talking about climate change, why I'm focused on it and um, how legislation can address it. Um, then we're gonna move into a little bit of background on social interaction and idea flow and how uh, human interaction can drive both beliefs and behaviors. Uh, then we're going to move into talking about climate sentiment or idea flow regarding climate change and how we can measure that to start to build political will for climate legislation. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the work that I've been doing in order to do that. Um, and then uh, we'll have time for a little bit of uh, Q&A. And I do want to caveat some of the ideas in the first section, I believe are going to build a little bit off of uh, Peter's presentation from last month. We did not coordinate that, but... Uh, of, that will happen a little bit. So let's start with talking about climate change. 73% of Americans believe that climate change is a problem, yet very few engage politically with the issue. Why is that? The problem here is not really polarization. Um, yes, there are people that don't believe that climate change is a problem, um, but as we can see here, it is not the vast, it is not the majority. The vast majority believe that it is an issue. So how is it that the bulk of Americans know that climate change is a problem, and yet the United States is unable to pass adequate legislation to address this problem? That is what I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, I'm a designer, and so I am approaching this problem um, from a little bit of a design perspective. Uh, designing solutions to social issues can be somewhat challenging because a lot of these social challenges exist within really complex systems, complex social systems, economic systems. And often when we design solutions, they tend to have sort of unintended uh, impacts on those systems. Um, but we can apply what is known as systems thinking to analyze how those systems work. And then we can design solutions that actually reshape the systems themselves, the systems that are causing and exacerbating these social challenges. Because the obstacles to combating climate change are largely social, um, solving climate change is inherently a social issue. And so framing it as a systems level design challenge allows us to shift our focus to looking at how the systems that are creating the problem are designed. And so that's the approach that I am applying to this research, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So why am I focusing on climate change? I think a lot of you um, are probably somewhat familiar with the issue, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the challenges that it poses. I think this graph speaks for itself. Um, 2023 was the warmest year since records began, and we've seen it. Um, we've seen it here in the Northeast with um, flooding in New Hampshire, the really weird weather patterns that we've been having, the strange storms. We've seen wildfires across Hawaii and Canada, poor air quality across the Northeast and Midwest US. Um, the Atlantic Ocean is freakishly warm right now, which is impacting uh, marine life and uh, ecosystems. And unfortunately, as glaciers melt, um, that causes cascading effects and even more warning, even more warming. I want to also look at some other areas that are a little bit less commonly discussed that are impacted by climate change. Climate change is absolutely a national security risk. Um, the Department of Defense is worried about secure is very worried about security challenges due to climate change. Um, you can see here these are some soldiers from the 101st Airborne up in Alaska doing some training up near the Arctic. Um, in the Arctic, uh, climate change is melting sea ice, which is dramatically altering the natural environment, um, creating a new free a new frontier of geostrategic competition, and frankly, it's a new border with Russia. 
Um, and it's not just the U.S. either. Um, the U.N. is also very worried about uh, security challenges due to climate change, including uh, competition over natural resources, uh, climate-related disasters, forced migration and displacement. Um, the list goes on. Climate change is also a justice issue. Um, as we can see on this map, climate change disproportionately impacts uh, both developing countries and countries in the global south. Uh, this is due to extreme heat, drought, uh, wet and weather events that lead to drops in agricultural production and rises in food insecurity. Now, I just want to contrast this map right here with the next map that I'm going to show you. So here is the countries that are disproportionately burdened by climate change. Now this map shows the share of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions as of 2022. And we can see that the United States has far and away the highest cumulative carbon dioxide emissions um, as of 2022. So here is, so to speak, the countries that are really creating much of this problem have created much of this problem. Um, and here are the countries that are impacted uh, largely by this problem. And we can see that this is very much a justice issue. I think too often um, we despair of the problem and that leads us to inaction. It's almost like this paralysis that we experience from the enormity of the problem. And so I think it's really important to focus on narratives of hope. Um, the good news is uh, with the right legislation, the United States can dramatically uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And I do want to caveat that we need global cooperation and global legislation. Um, but my background is in uh, advocating in U.S. policy, and um, I will be focusing on the U.S. and U.S. politics for this research. I also want to note that some of the proposed legislation does also apply pressure globally to enact um, pieces of legislation in other countries. So let's talk some solutions. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a climate advocacy group, created this graph. Um, this shows the impact of different policies on emissions. And so we can see here that uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are decreasing, um, which is good, but they're not decreasing nearly fast enough. If we look at this dotted line, this is um, our target as it, for 2030, and we're not going to hit it. Um, but there are pieces of legislation that will get us uh, big portions of the way there. Um, we can see the red here. This is permitting reform. Um, the EPA projected that the IRA would reduce uh, U.S. emissions by 35 to 43 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. Um, however, if we don't increase our expansion of electrical transmission lines, we could lose over 80 percent of those potential em emissions reductions. Um, a big bottleneck for um, getting those electrical transmission lines is the permitting process, which is extremely slow right now. Um, so permitting reform can make a really big difference. Another thing that can make a really big difference is a carbon tax, um, which you see here in the blue. Um, the government basically puts a price on carbon, um, charging the emitters for the amount of carbon that they emit. Uh, and this is widely supported by economists and scientists. And as we can see in this graph, it has a huge impact on emissions. I'm not gonna go into this tool because I know that, um, that Peter talked about it last month, but it is a really interesting tool to go in and actually look at the effects of different policies on climate uh, emissions um, and emissions reductions. Um, but the bottom line here is that there is absolutely legislation that we can pass that will make a really big difference uh, in fighting climate change. But we need political will. According to Anthony Lezerowitz in his book, Building Public and Political Will for Climate Change Action, climate legislation is inhibited by a lack of political will or an unwillingness or inability of government officials to enact policies that will reduce carbon pollution at the scale and speed required. And in order to build political will, we need public will. However, most people are not familiar with the potential gains um, of uh, passing climate legislation, and frankly, the public will does not really exist to generate this political will. Um, and without very broad and diverse popular understanding, um, it'll be really difficult to pass this climate legislation. Um, however, Lezerowitz also states that strong public demand increases the likelihood that governments will prioritize climate change action. We do 
need voices from all communities having conversations about climate solutions and advocating for them. Um, elected officials need to know that climate change is a priority. Unfortunately, there are really just not enough conversations about it. 65% uh, of Americans say that they rarely or never discuss climate change with their family and friends. Um, and Americans are somewhat divided on whether uh, climate change is even solvable. Given the opportunity to speak with an expert on climate change, one of the top three questions that Americans would ask is, is there still time to reduce global warming or is it too late? And even in research, the focus is really largely on um, how concerned Americans are about climate change, um, their perceived risk of it, and maybe their uh, individual uh, behaviors. But there is not very much research on uh, what conversations Americans are having about climate change or about their understanding of climate change solutions, especially legislated ones. So, how do we generate more conversations around climate change and its solutions? How might we spread ideas and understanding about political solutions to climate change? And how do we encourage a broad diversity of communities to engage politically with climate change? And by diversity, I do mean our typical demographics such as you know, age, race, gender, that kind of thing. But I also mean political diversity. Um, climate change can and should be a bipartisan issue. And at the end of the day, we need folks on both sides of the aisle to stand up and advocate for climate legislation. So to answer some of these questions, I'm gonna to turn to a little bit of research on how ideas and behaviors spread through communities and society via peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Research shows that peer-to-peer -peer interaction is a very strong predictor of idea flow through a population as well as influencer of behavior change. Um, Penland defines idea flow as the propagation of behaviors and beliefs through a social network by means of social learning and social pressure. So the key element here is peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, interactions between close friends are really less significant um, than very frequent inter exposures and interactions with large circles of acquaintances that you interact with casually, but again, like I said, on a frequent basis. Um, and it's not just interactions either, uh, exposure to or observations of others' behavior um, also really influences idea flow. In one study of a bunch of first-year college students across a dorm, uh, showed that people with similar, uh, that lots of interaction um, and exposure to uh, people with similar views predicted students' voting behavior. However, the people that they actually spoke politics with um, or their close friends was not predictive of their voting behavior. Um, then there's also substantial research mapping and redesigning systems of uh, human interaction to increase organizational efficiency. Uh, in one study, they coordinated the coffee breaks for empl all employees on a team to be at the same time to increase interactions among team members. And they found that that actually increased productivity, uh, something to the tune of $15 million. And we can scale these concepts up to cities. Um, mapping idea flow through a city could be used to improve efficiency in health, transportation, and social programs. It's not just social interaction and exposure either. Um, social incentives have also shown to be far more uh, powerful than other incentives, such as economic incentives. Uh, in one study you can see here, uh, Facebook users were shown two, one of two different get out the vote messages, uh, one without pictures of their friends. And then you can see the one down here has pictures of their friends that have voted. Um, and users that were shown the get out the vote message with photos of their friends attached to it, who are much more likely to report themselves as also voting. So turning back to our political engagement with climate change, our design framing raises two questions. The first, how do human interactions and idea flow across the city impact public perceptions of climate change? And then two, how might we redesign that impact to build political will for climate legislation? 
Which brings us to our next section, what I call climate sentiment or idea flow regarding climate change and how we might tap into that idea flow to build political will for climate legislation. Um, it's been suggested that idea flow can be used to drive solutions to a wide swath of problems, including climate change. Um, and I really think that research in this space gives us a new starting point where we can start to explore the social challenges behind building political will to fight climate change. So how might we go about that? The first step is to understand how ideas and political engagement with climate change currently flow through communities. So in short, we need to measure the existing climate sentiment in an area. There's research indicating that we can measure human interactions and idea flow using what has been termed digital breadcrumbs or little bits of digital data that people leave as they go about their day-to-day -day life. So think of things like um, GPS data or location data from a cell phone, um, social media posts, um, purchase data, things of that nature. Um, when we use systems thinking um, to design complex social systems, we, we run the risk of being somewhat reductionist. And that's because we are in essence simplifying a system in order to understand it, make meaning of it, and analyze it. Um, and while that's necessary, um, we can, it can also result in us losing individual patterns of interaction and individual behaviors. And as we've seen, those individual interactions and behaviors uh, can be very significant in impacting how the overall system behaves. So if we can start to incorporate some of these um, individual interactions and behaviors into our system uh, via these digital breadcrumbs, um, then we can create a lot more in-depth models of the system. Um, there's been uh, exploration of the idea of using, uh, of collecting such digital breadcrumbs, uh, what has been termed social sensing, um, and then trying to discover patterns in that data that's been collected, which has been termed social mining, um, to build something known as a planetary nervous system that could be used to explore complex questions about our society. Now, I'm not trying to build a planetary nervous system this year. However, I do think we can apply some of these concepts as an entry point to start to detect the impact that social interaction is having on climate sentiment. So if we can use these digital breadcrumbs to model how human interactions and idea flow are affecting perceptions and political behavior towards climate change, might this allow us to start to design shifts into that system to generate conversations and more political engagement with climate change solutions. I am exploring using different technologies to do that uh, this year and hopefully beyond. <laughs> um, Marchetti argues that we can pair digital data with traditional small unit estimators, um, such as survey data would be the most common example of that. Um, and so in doing that, we can start to have a more robust understanding. Um, so I'm looking into both types of data for my research. So there's a couple layers of data that we can pair together to start to measure patterns in idea flow regarding climate change. Uh, the first is the geographic distribution of climate concern and political engagement. So basically where are people um, that are concerned with climate change and where do people live and move that are not concerned with climate change? Where do people live and move that engage politically in, uh, with climate change? Um, where do people live and move that do not engage politically with climate change? And then do we start to see patterns in where people live, where they are, um, and how they feel towards these things? Geography really matters. So this graph demonstrates the probability of befriending a particular person compared to their physical proximity of that person. Um, so as you can see, the probability, the probability of befriending a particular person is inversely proportional to the number of geographically closer people for about two thirds of friendships. I think the other one third is like um, long distance or social media friendships. Um, but basically what this graph is showing you, us is that you're much more likely to become friends with a person if you are geographically close to them and there are not as many geographically closer people to you. 
Um, that is to say, the closer you are to somebody, the more likely you are to interact with them, the more likely you are to become friends with them. Second, we can start to look at hotspots of idea exchange that engage with climate change. So by that, I mean uh, things like businesses um, or places where people basically interact. Um, so thinking like bars, coffee shops, convenience stores, corner stores, um, places where people run into each other and have casual conversations. And then if we look at those businesses, um, we can see, do they engage with climate change? Do they post about climate change? Do they talk about climate change? And then if so, do we start to see any patterns in the locations of those businesses and the geographic distribution of where people are concerned about climate change and where they're engaged politically with it? Um, consumer patterns are also geographic, or sorry, consumer behavior is also geographically patterned. Um, consumers tend to shop at geographically proximate locations in somewhat predictable patterns. And so can we start to see um, correlations between how, where people live, how they feel about climate change, and um, where there are these hotspots of idea exchange that engage with climate change? Finally, we can look at movement trajectories across a region as a sort of proxy for how ideas are flowing throughout an area. Um, research has shown that mobility patterns are correlated with a lot of socioeconomic indicators. Um, groups of people with similar behavior demographics tend to have similar movement patterns across cities. Um, and these movement patterns have predictive power for a lot of different beliefs and behaviors, including political views. Um, and these things tend to be more predictive than something like just zip code, for example. And so we can start to use these movement trajectories to visualize and understand how and where people are living, where they're moving, where they're working, how they are traveling throughout a city, um, where they are engaging with each other. And if we start to overlay that movement data and those movement trajectories with these other data sources, then we can start to look for more patterns and correlations. So do we start to see patterns between uh, people's movement trajectories and then maybe hotspots of idea exchange along those movement trajectories that engage with climate change? And if we do start to see those patterns, are there correlations between that and whether those people are concern more concerned about climate change and whether they engage politically with it? And what does that look like? As we start to overlay these different data sources, we can look and see if there are silos in um, where, I, where people are moving or not engaging with each other and uh, silos in how they feel about climate change and uh, how they engage with it politically. And if we do start to find these patterns and these correlations between idea flow and climate sentiment, we can use that information to start to open up pathways of idea exchange across communities. Um, there is research using social media data and community language models to gauge community sentiment um, in order to identify overly partisan viewpoints with the long-term intent of fostering constructive communication between those different communities. I think this research could be extended um, except for applying it to different behavior demographics and looking at how those behavior demographics feel differently or engage differently throughout climate change. Um, I think there's also potential in looking at research on how social incentives drive behavior. And I think this could also potentially be a way to open up pathways of idea exchange and behavior change. So a quick recap, because I think that was a lot. <laughs> um, so we need to understand from a geographic perspective, which people are concerned about climate change, which people engage politically with it, where they are, and if there are patterns between these beliefs and behaviors, uh, people's geographic movement trajectories, and those potential hotspots of idea exchange that are engaging with climate change. And to do this, we can use digital breadcrumbs paired with traditional data sources to start to measure this. So that brings us into the work that I have been doing this year and am in the middle of. Um, so I've been pretty much focusing on the first two, uh, geographic distribution of climate concern and political engagement um, and hotspots of idea exchange that engage with climate change. Um, I do hope to 
uh, start to look at movement trajectories um, in the future. So I've been gathering data on climate sentiment and political engagement across Portland, Maine. Uh, why did I pick Portland, Maine? In part because I live here and I needed to be geographically proximate for some of my data procure procurement methods. Um, but Maine is also a pretty interesting place to study climate um, or study climate change sentiment. Um, it's been a leader in a lot of conservation efforts and a lot of people in a lot of areas that are very concerned about conservation. Uh, that being said, I do hope ultimately that this research can be expanded to other cities. So to detect climate sentiment and engagement, I've started off by trying to answer four questions. The first question is, how are people's varying levels of concern towards climate towards the climate crisis geographically distributed across Portland, Maine? How are people's varying levels of political engagement related to climate change geographically distributed across Portland, Maine? Are there areas or communities where people are more or less politically engaged with the climate crisis? And are there geographic patterns or correlations between climate sentiment, political engagement, and public places that engage with climate change? So I've been collecting data from multiple sources in order to do this. Um, including, as I mentioned, both traditional small unit estimators and digital data, although digital data is a little bit harder to come by, so that will come more in, um, in phase two as I start to look at movement data. Um, I do want to caveat before we go into this that, like I said, I'm right in the middle of this project. I have not completed the analysis yet, um, and I'm hoping to do some more sophisticated modeling on a lot of the data um, to try to get some higher accuracy results. But I do think we can start to see some results unfold. And more importantly, I think we can start to see a picture of where this research is going and um, how this will start to help us. So the first data source is opinion surveys across Maine. Um, this was a survey put out by a digital research agency um, that included a question uh, on climate concern. Um, and the survey was conducted throughout the state of Maine. Second, Climate Change Opinions Digital Surveys. Um, this is a project that I launched this past winter, um, basically collecting across the greater Portland area uh, via QR code, um, people's opinions on climate change and their levels of engagement with it. And third is Facebook data, um, public pages mentioning climate change, which uh, tend to be businesses that have posted about climate change. So here we can see the geographic distribution of answers to the question, please select the time frame that you believe best describes when you think global warming will start having impacts, harmful impacts on Maine. Um, so as I said, I have not yet uh, completed the modeling that I want to um, for this data. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, and it does only give us zip code level granularity. I think ideally we want to start to visualize this at like a high, a very high resolution. Um, I'm talking neighborhood or census track level. Um, and of course, it only gives us uh, climate concern and not political engagement. Uh, that being said, I think it starts to give us a reference point for levels of concern um, in, across Southern Maine. And we can also use this data as a validator for other data sets. Um, so already here, we start to see some interesting things along the coast. Um, compared to moving inland. And I think as I apply um, some more modeling for a greater level of accuracy, it'll be interesting to see if these patterns start to hold true. Um, in order to understand how and whether people across Portland engage politically with climate change, I launched this project to collect survey responses digitally via QR code. If you live in Portland, you've probably seen it. Maybe you've even taken the survey. If so, thank you. Um, but essentially, I hung up uh, uh, QR codes throughout the city um, that basically linked to a website where um, people can fill out uh, this form. It asks questions about uh, how concerned people are with climate change, whether they engage politically, some basic demographic data, and then ask them to select their neighborhood. So essentially, their census block. So this starts to give us a really, really high level of location granularity um, when assessing this. 
I put the QR codes on two different types of um, documents, I guess. The one was uh, a poster asking expressly, are you concerned about climate change? So this one is a little bit self-selective, right? It's more likely to engage people who actually care. And then this one I put on candy bowls, um, which did not explicitly say what the survey was for. It just asked people uh, to take a piece of candy and to take the survey. Interesting note, the candy bowls were far and away the most successful. Uh, most people don't really care about posters about climate change, but people care a lot about candy. So um, basically I fed the entire city of Portland candy for a couple months and um, got quite a few survey responses. So I ended up with just under 120, 120 responses. Um, and here are some early results uh, mapped by census block. And again, I do want to caveat that this data is just disaggregated right now. So it's not very accurate. Once we are able to actually model it with demographics and pair it with uh, census data, it will become um, a little more accurate or quite a bit more accurate. But we can still start to see some interesting things. Um, so this map on the left here uh, shows climate concern across Portland. So you can see the bright green is um, very concerned about climate change. The blue, darker blue, not so much. So it looks like across Portland, people are pretty concerned about climate change. Um, there is a little bit of nuance to that, but far and away they are. Um, but if we look over here at this map on the right, I think things get a little bit more interesting. Um, I calculated a political engagement score for uh, survey respondents uh, based off their response to a question that listed several different types of um, political engagement, including um, do you contact your congressional representatives? Do you comment on legislation? Do you talk with family and friends about climate change? Do you vote? I weighted each of those um, activities and then used them to calculate an overall score. So you can start to see that um, people's level of political engagement is not necessarily correlating with, um, with their concern for climate change. And there's actually quite a bit of variability um, throughout the city on how much people engage. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see going forward, especially as I um, sort of complete this analysis, if there even is any correlation at all between how concerned people are about climate change and whether they engage politically with it. I don't know. I'm really excited to find that out. So then the last uh, data source that I want to talk about today is Facebook data, um, pages, again, that are usually businesses um, that mention climate change. So um, I collected this data using Meta's con new content library API. It's an API they released, I believe, last November. They put out an early access trial for researchers interested in it, and it was actually pretty good. Um, you can query both Facebook data and Instagram. Instagram data. It's all anonymous, um, but you can get some pretty good information. So I queried all posts that mention climate change or global warming in the month of January. I then queried the pages that posted those posts and then filtered those pages based off of either pages that state their city and state is uh, Portland, Maine, or that listed their zip code as one of the zip codes in the greater Portland area. Uh, and then I linked those pages back with the posts. So you can see here, these dots are the locations of businesses that have been posting about climate change. Um, each dot represents one business and the size of the dot represents how many posts they posted. And then the uh, color scheme represents the level of engagement with those posts. So the really pink dots received quite a bit of, of user engagement. Um, with their posts and the blue dots, uh, not so much. So we start to see there's a lot of businesses right along here, this strip here that are posting about climate change. And that's perhaps to be expected. Um, many of you probably know this is a pretty main uh, throwaway through here. It kind of goes down into the historic district. So that might be what we expect. Um, what I think is also kind of interesting is as you might know, there's a lot of businesses that kind of go along this strip here. Um, and none of them are posting about climate change. So um, I think it'll be really interesting to start to look and see if there are correlations between that and, and some of the earlier geographic data that we looked at. So as I mentioned a couple of times, um, I am right in the middle still of the data analysis. Um, so the findings are still murky. Um, 
But I think we can start to see how we can use these methodologies to start to paint a picture of pockets across Portland, Maine, of where people are concerned about climate change, where they're engaging politically with it, um, and what types of correlations that has with um, these hotspots of where people uh, are engaging uh, or engaging politically with climate change. So uh, there's a couple next steps that I am hoping to take for this research. First, as I've mentioned probably about six times now, <laughs> I need to improve uh, the modeling that I've done uh, to a lot of the data uh, to improve the accuracy of, of that mapping and those results. Uh, from there, I am looking to work with telecommunications companies um, accessing cell phone data in order to map mobility patterns throughout Portland, Maine. There is precedent for working with telecommunications companies to access location data. Um, as far as I know, there is not precedent for that in Portland, but uh, we'll see how that goes. But if anybody uh, knows any connections or has any connections on that front, um, I would love to hear from you. And then finally, uh, start to overlay those movement trajectories with the data that we looked at earlier on individuals' uh, climate sentiment and political engagement, as well as those businesses that are posting out about climate change, and start to see if we can identify some geospatial patterns, and also to see if we can start to identify silos. Are there silos in where people are really not engaging politically, and then can we actually visualize the movement trajectories that are maybe, that are maybe divergent for, for different groups of people? Um, there is some future work I'm looking at as well, um, very long term for this project, but looking at how we start to foster communication across these different potential silos, across these different behavior demographics that have different levels of engagement. I talked earlier about the uh, community LM project to foster constructive communication, maybe something like that. I'm also looking at uh, perhaps an urban design focus. So thinking about how cities are designed that they actually start to um, facilitate human interactions or not. Um, and what does that look like? And how does that impact um, the types of conversations and these patterns that we're seeing? And then finally looking at expanding this research to other cities. Um, I think it'd be really, really interesting to start to map other cities as well, and then see if there's patterns between how cities are laid out, how they're designed, um, how they facilitate uh, interaction across their different silos, and then if that has any correlation with um, how cities overall are dealing with the climate crisis and how they feel about it. My research is, um, pretty focused on understanding systems of interaction um, and measuring and increasing engagements across uh, society more broadly um, and increasing engagements uh, between humans with varying levels of concern and behaviors towards climate change. So it's inherently not individually focused. That being said, I think there are some takeaways that we can take from the research on an individual level um, for what we as individuals can do. So I would say first, um, Thinking about our behavior demographics, uh, like I said, we kind of tend to move in predictable patterns and predictable behaviors. And then sometimes we go on what's considered like bouts of exploration where we deviate from those um, typical movement trajectories. Increasing those bouts of ex exploration is actually really important. Thinking about the diversity of people that we're actually interacting with um, is really important. Then thinking how we can break out of our sort of typical demographics to increase our exposure to other thoughts, other ideas, other opinions. And then I think the single most important thing that we can all do um, when it comes to climate change is just talking about it, talking about it with everyone, having open and honest conversations about climate change, about its solutions, um, is really, really important. And it's a hard thing to do. It's a really difficult thing to do. We don't want to talk about climate change. It feels depressing. It feels doom and gloom. Um, it's kind of a buzzkill. Um, somebody who was giving me some feedback on this research mentioned the media. Uh, the media doesn't even like writing about climate change because nobody wants to read about it because it's depressing. Um, but it is critically important to be having these conversations. We have to keep talking about it um, and it's important also when we do it to focus on empathy and listening, meeting people where they're at. We're not going to be changing minds. We're not going to be um, convincing people of things overnight. Meeting people where they're at, having empathy and listening and just continuously engaging over and over and over again, even when it's difficult, is really, really important. 
So in conclusion, climate change is a major threat to stability, health, and well-being, and government legislation is required to address the issue fast enough. Um, idea flow via peer-to-peer -peer interaction is a very strong predictor of beliefs and individual behavior change across a population, and we can use that. We can use idea flow to start to measure how that idea flow impacts climate sentiment. And if we can measure how that idea flow influences climate sentiment, then we can use that understanding to start to design shifts in systems of human interaction to increase conversations and build political will for climate change solutions. I wanna thank you all very much for attending today. Um, it's wonderful and I know you're all busy, so I really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, maybe we can open it up to some questions. Absolutely. And Casey, thank you so much. What what interesting work. And I just am so grateful for any opportunity that we have to, to come together and think about how we talk about something that, that so clearly motivates all of us. Um, it's really hard. I know sometimes I, I just can't even wrap my head around the fact that people aren't thinking and talking about the climate crisis all the time because that's my full-time job. <laughs> and, um, and so it's it's so helpful to sort of zoom out a little bit and think about what are what are normal people talking about. <laughs> Um, so I am so grateful for everybody who is on this call right now. Um, you will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with the link to this recording and a few other resources to help you uh, explore Casey's research and some of the other work going on around climate conversations. So, so keep an eye out for that and absolutely notice in the next few days, in the next few weeks, where are you likely to have conversations that, that could be climate conversations? Are there places that, that you visit, places that aren't in your usual routine that might be, uh, just zoom out a little bit and, and think about that uh, and, and let us know what you hear, what, you, what comes up. Casey, we have so many good questions. I already know we're not going to get to all of them. And so I want to make sure that we start with um, with the top, which is, how did you design this project? There's so much interest in, in your background and lots of questions about how your, your role as an Army reservist influences your thinking about, about climate. So rather than, you know, with just a little bit of that sort of flavor, how did you come up with this? <laughs> um, well, that's sort of a long story, actually. Um, I guess the the shortened version is um, I, I've been very interested for a very long time in sort of why we generate these weird systems that don't seem very productive at all. And I mean, we can apply that to anything, right? Um, there, there's a lot of systems that are not working for us. And so I was very interested in sort of how do we start to make systems work better? Um, as I mentioned, I'm a software engineer. And as I started learning more about um, sort of the computer science aspect, it made sense to me that, you know, we could start to apply computer science um, to actually start to model some of these systems and play around with different ideas. Um, the climate change part came a little bit later. Um, I started doing work with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby and obviously I've drawn a ton of inspiration from them. And that really uh, started to be more of, of, a, of a climate advocate and just started to see how this research fit so like really dovetailed perfectly um, with the work I was doing on CCL side, which focuses on um, a lot of grassroots outreach, um, and then kind of my research interests of looking at these systems and looking at these systems of uh, human interaction. Um, I would love to say that the Army's had a major influence on that. Um, it hasn't outside the fact that I am deeply attuned to the national security risk. Um, and I have certainly spent time listening to uh, individuals in the Army who are a lot higher ranked than I am. Um, talking about the national security risks. So that kind of played in a little bit too. So interesting. And, and I'm 
making some assumptions here that that you might hear conversations that are different than than the ones that I hear in my my professional circles. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. And that is another part of it. I interact through the army with a lot of different people um, and hear a lot of different viewpoints, which is also fascinating to me, um, listening to people how and how they talk about these things. Absolutely. You mentioned you mentioned the design principles that can sort of push people to engage or to think about things in a different way. Will you say more about that? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so, uh, I mean, I kind of approach a lot of problems from a design perspective um, because my background is largely in design, but I think design frameworks and design thinking give us a really helpful framework for appro approaching problems because it starts from an assumption that you sort of don't under necessarily understand the problem and you need to understand the problem better. So in this particular instance, we're looking at why people don't engage politically with climate change. Um, well, we know that they don't do that, right? That's the problem. And so we can try to get them to do that. But if we don't fully understand why they're not engaging in the first place, then that sort of forces us to take a step back. So in the design uh, process, we start with what's kind of, we don't start with the problem statement. That's actually in the middle. We start with this thing known as like an itch where you're like, huh, something's wrong. I got to kind of suss out what that is. And then you just do research. You do research around that. So I've sort of designed this project in line with the design process um, and looking at it as how we can redesign systems. Well, first, if um, we have a problem in the system, we need to understand what that problem is. And so then that brings us into our research phase where we're actually trying to analyze and understand these systems of human action, of human interaction. We're trying to visualize them and compare them to climate change so that we can start to really understand what is going on here. Where are these people that are not engaging in climate change? What does that look like? Um, and then we can start to define our problem statement, right? Then we can start to look at, can we visualize these idea silos? And then that gives us a much more specific jumping point to actually start to look at solutions, as opposed to saying, we have this nebulous problem, we're not even sure what the problem is, and then we're throwing spaghetti at the wall, um, trying, to, trying to solve it. And so in short, I think the design process really gives us this useful framework for stepping back and making sure that we really understand the problem um, before we try to address it. I hope that answers the question and was not a, a tangent. <laughs> no, I think that's really helpful. And, and I'm gonna try to reframe it and tell me if I've got it right, because I'm, I, I think for, for many of us, you know, we, we, we think and talk about climate change all the time. So, so one of the things I hear you saying is like, yes, that's because you're in a silo and, and that's human. It's a, it's not a bad thing. You're not in trouble, but, but you're not going to change who you're interacting with if you stay in that silo. And so you're really helping to, to give us a graphical data-driven understanding of where those silos are and maybe some some places we could bridge them. Does that sound right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if we're all in this climate circle, and I absolutely include myself in that, and I'm looking around at my climate friends and asking, why can't we pass climate legislation? Well, we're not going to get very far because we're only in our own little, uh, you know, our own little subset. But yeah, expanding that research, absolutely. Um, and, and looking more broadly on in patterns, right? Patterns across society. We're all really driven by these kind of patterns of human interaction. As much as we wish that we weren't, <laughs> we really are. We're super influenced by our peers. And so taking a step back and understanding how those patterns are influencing us and then how they vary across other ways, exactly. And I think design gives us the tools to do that. So this might actually be the, the answer to this next question, which is, you know, what does the research show about having these conversations with, with family and friends who presumably are in our silos with us and, and with strangers who might not be? Is that is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say for this research, I'm not super um, focusing on that because I'm much more interested uh, in how we just increase sheer quantity of engagements between different types of people with different viewpoints. That being said, 
I think um, what you've mentioned, how do we actually deliberately have these conversations with um, family is like such an important, such an important question. I don't want to pretend to be an expert on a thing that I am not. Um, so what I will say is that um, I think increasing, uh, when we start to start to think about increasing these amounts of engagements, it doesn't necessarily have to be forced conversations. Like I am walking into this weird bar that I never go to because I want to talk to a bunch of people about climate change. Like that's really not it. It's really more as we get more people deviating into these different spaces, they start to have these conversations that start to shift their beliefs and their observations. And again, that happens at a mass, at a mass system level. That is super helpful because you're right. If we're thinking about this as a, okay, I'm going to go to a new coffee shop, not the coffee shop I normally go to. And while I'm waiting for my drink, I'm going to say, boy, climate change. <laughs> that that might not give me the results I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, people love to talk about the weather. And so these topics come up, right? These things come up. Uh, how we see things, um, that rubs off. Um, so how so is that is that your advice for how do we start these conversations and especially I love this this phrase um, especially when we're unsure about the reactions we'll get and any pointers for climate anxious introverts that's I I need that I'm gonna get that as a bumper sticker climate anxious introverts I love it I yeah. see you out there <laughs> I love that too yeah I would say. Um, don't force it. I mean, the biggest thing anybody can do to break their own kind of like paralysis and anxiety of the problem, I think is to just do something like anything will just makes us feel better. Um, any kind of action. Um, but yeah, I would say like, we can't force this stuff, right? Like when I have conversations, let's take the, the military, for example, because I do have conversations about climate change with people in the military, but it's never me saying, um, you know, I'm gonna tell you about climate change <laughs> and about my research. Um, I think those conversations very much need to meet the person where they're at. Like people see this stuff. They know the weather has been weird. The climate has been weird. Like let them come to you, you know, they will talk about it. But what do you think about that? I remember really, this is super anecdotal, but, um, I was having a very interesting conversation with a cup with a soldier, an ex soldier. Um, and one was dead set against climate change. And I said, yeah, but you know, you know, some weird stuff has been going on and it, it means this. And the other one perked right up and she said, you know what? I used to live on this island in the Pacific and you're right, it's completely changed. And so that's enough, you know, just meeting people where they're at, I think is really important. We've come to the part of the program where I am anxiously looking at the list of questions and thinking, how many more can we ask and which ones should I start with? Um, I am really, so how about this? Is there a, a time frame element to your work or is there a, a way to sort of track what you're seeing over time? Because I, I think you have a sort of snapshot here, right? But But hopefully, hopefully that snapshot is changing all the time. Yeah, I love that question. That is such a good question. Yeah, how do we make this research temporal? Um, so originally I was looking at, uh, more focus on social media data, which is actually really useful because it's all time stamped. And I still think that there is potential in that direction, especially as these content libraries, um, start to open up. But I also think that just making this research easily rep replicatable or replicable, um, is pretty important. So for me, and I think a time frame is a really good question also because we're running up on such a tight, um, such a tight time frame just in terms of climate change. And so I feel a little bit of pressure of like, can this research even move fast enough? Um, but I think by making it replicable across cities um, and then conducting it like yearly over time, which is a hope and a plan that I have um, for, I'm hoping to pursue a PhD. And so then during that time period, then we can st start to build up that uh, temporal aspect. And that's also important for just testing our solutions, right? We start to implement solutions, then we want to know, um, are they even having any effect? I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more question. Um, and, and it's a huge one. So 
beware. Okay. <laughs> I just am so, so interested in this role that the work that you do as a, as a reservist and you're starting at the very top of the program with how climate change is affecting national security. Does that feel like a framing that, that could sort of help us break out of silos that might, might build some bridges to folks who on different parts of the political spectrum? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, yeah, I don't want to say different parts of the political spectrum, although maybe that is so, but I would say different pockets of people that feel different ways, right? So people who um, feel strongly about the military, which some conservative people do, obviously not all, right? Some liberal people as well. Um, then yeah, I think absolutely that can be used as a bridge. And I think more broadly, that's a really, really good point. Um, and there's a lot of different aspects to this, right? Like we can identify a lot of different aspects to this problem that resonate differently with different people. Um, when I first joined the military, I actively had people stand up in some of my classes and say, who here thinks climate change is real? you're wrong and it's a joke. And these were my uh, instructors, you know, these were people in positions of power. So that's fairly concerning. Um, but now you start to see a shift where you have higher ranking people who are actually talking about this as a significant issue. Um, and so I think across the military, that's also really helpful um, as well. Nisi, thank you so much. You have given us all so much to, to think about and to talk about with the people in our circles and the people outside of our circles. So I'm I'm really grateful for you and, and thanks for, for spending this time with us today. Thanks to all of you. You asked so many good questions in the chat. I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. And, uh, and I really look forward to continuing this conversation. You know, Maggie and I always love to get messages from you and, uh, and we are happy to share anything that, that you really want to hear back from Casey on. Um, we can, we can make that happen. We will be back in this space next week for a really interesting program with a couple of folks from the National Renewable Energy Labs. They're gonna walk us through the role of community benefits agreements in, uh, in land and offshore wind. Uh, it's gonna be a, a really great and important introduction. You'll get more information about it in the follow-up email and I hope to see you then. Until then, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, make sure you have your eclipse glasses before you uh, you check it out on Monday, but we are in for a treat, I think. So uh, have a wonderful weekend and we will see you soon. Thank you all so much. <laughs>